Good evening. My name is Kacper Paradowski and you're watching Poland Daily News. According to unofficial reports, a proposal to break the deadlock on the new EU budget was brought up during the European Union summit in Brussels. Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki said earlier that there was a clinch at the summit budget talks in Brussels. Negotiations are very difficult, and that is because few of the countries, perhaps not intentionally, do not see that relationship. If we want a stronger Europe, along with new opening of the new term of the EU Parliament, a new term of the European Commission, we need an ambitious budget. Ambitious Europe needs an ambitious budget. There is no way you can do more for less money, and this is what some countries propose. At the same time, some of the richest countries of the EU want to limit access to funds for the countries which are catching up, those which are developing with the strongest rate of growth. And because of that, the negotiations last night stalled in a clinch. We presented our points, our conditions, similar to those presented by our friends from the Visegrad group and a few more countries from Central Europe. But basically, we aim that our Western European partners understand that the single market is truly beneficial to us all. The budget itself is only a small piece, a part of the great adventure called the European Union. An adventure which is good for everyone and at the same time ambitious. The ambition should be followed by sure funds, and here we are trying to convince a few smaller countries of the European Union to support that. I do not know if we will manage to succeed during the current meeting of the European Council. If not, there will be future summits, and we will see. We firmly defend our interests, and we are in good company of countries who have similar views, similar problems. Last night's negotiations, the ones with Charles Michel and the bilateral ones, weren't bad, they were good. The chairman of the European Commission is trying hard to bring everyone closer, and we appreciate that very much. We might come to an agreement, or we will stay until Saturday for more negotiations, if there will be a basis for it. New tapes from the so-called 2014 Watergate scandal have leaked to the public. On the tapes, former Socialist Prime Minister Leszek Miller and the late Jan Kulczyk, Poland's then richest person, discussed the history of the Solidarity Trade Union leader and former president Lech Wałęsa. Miller makes it clear that he has information about Wałęsa being brought by the Communist Secret Service in a motorboat to the strike at the Gdańsk shipyard in 1980, which launched the Solidarity Movement. Documents confirming that Wałęsa was a paid communist informer were found in the safe of the late former Communist Minister of Interior, Czesław Kiszczak, in 2018, stirring up emotions across the country. General Zbigniew Nowak, a longtime deputy minister of defense from the times of the Polish People's Republic and a close associate of General Jaruzelski during martial law, was buried close to Aleja Zasłużonych in Warsaw's Powązki district. During the funeral of the communist general, veterans and KPN activists protested. This man is being buried here at the Powązki Cemetery, on our national pantheon, and he is to be buried among the heroes of the Home Army, among the insurgents. They say that his son's grave is there, but ladies and gentlemen, it should not be like this. This should not be allowed. These are Powązki. This is the largest and most important cemetery for Poland after Wawel, a place where Polish heroes lie, the important people, and not the communist red filth brought on Soviet tanks. My heart is in pain, because five years have passed and many postulates that were to be carried out, such as the fact that the representatives of the security service will not be buried in the place of our national memory, where the grey ranks, the insurgents are lying, were simply not fulfilled. A federal court in Washington sentenced Roger Stone, former advisor and longtime associate of Donald Trump, to 40 months in prison for lying to Congress and intimidating a witness. The U.S. administration has previously appealed for a milder sentence. The President of the United States has not made a clear statement whether he was going to pardon his former colleague.
Robert Stone was convicted of lying to the Intelligence Committee about his attempts to contact WikiLeaks, the website that released damaging emails about Trump's 2016 Democratic election rival Hillary Clinton that US intelligence officials have concluded was stolen by Russian hackers. A jury of nine women and three men convicted Stone back in November on all seven counts of lying to Congress, obstruction of justice and witness tampering. The charges stemmed from special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation that detailed Russians meddling in the 2016 election to boost Trump's candidacy. Stone was one of several Trump associates named in Mueller's inquiry. After U.S. District Judge Amy Berman Jackson sentenced the veteran Republican operative in Washington, Trump indicated to an audience in Las Vegas that he has no immediate plans to pardon Stone and would let the legal process play out, but said that at some point he's going to make a determination. During the event, Trump called Stone a good person, but added he was not somebody who worked on his campaign. A federal judge said that Stone's lies to lawmakers investigating Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election amounted to a threat to American democracy. The Marxist Brazilian senator, Cid Gomes, was shot and wounded on Wednesday while trying to run over a group of striking military police with an earth mover in the northeastern state of Ceará. Brazilian media are using the incident, trying to blame right-wing president Jair Bolsonaro of fomenting an atmosphere in which violence can be used against political opponents. The news outlets conveniently forget to mention that Gomes was putting the lives of the officers at risk with the use of heavy machinery. Videos show the Brazilian politician driving an earth mover in an attempt to smash through a barricade behind which striking police officers had taken cover. In reaction to the threat of deadly violence, members of the striking side opened fire, wounding the politician. The brother of Cid Gomes, Ciro Gomes, a former governor of the state of Ceará, has accused President Bolsonaro of trying to take control of the state with force. The president's son, Eduardo Bolsonaro, an MP and himself a federal police officer, took to Twitter to condemn the action of Cid Gomes, writing, Imagine a person trying to run you over with an earth mover. What would you do? At least a reaction in defense of your own life. What Cid Gomes did was, at the very least, attempted murder. The police in the state have been striking for months against the left-wing forces controlling the state of Ceará, demanding higher wages. Bolsonaro's left-wing political opponents are now trying to use the violence against him, despite the fact that they themselves control the state of Ceará. That is all for tonight. Thank you for watching. Stay with us for Poland Daily Business. Good night. Hello and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. The forecast for tonight calls for cloudy skies in Szczecin and partly cloudy skies throughout the rest of the country. We can expect temperatures of 0 to 5 degrees. Tomorrow we will see showers in Koszalin, Gdańsk and Poznań, cloudy skies in the western and central regions of Poland, and partly cloudy skies in the east, south and in Warsaw. The temperatures will vary between 5 and 10 degrees. The next three days will bring showers on Sunday. By Monday we can expect better weather, with partly cloudy skies and temperatures reaching highs on Tuesday of 14 degrees. That is all for now. I thank you for joining us and I invite you to stay with us for Poland Daily Business. Poland Daily Business Edition. Our uh, guest tonight is Artur Wrublewski of Lazarski University. Sir, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me on the show. Let <laughs> us look a little bit on the economic data of Poland and are they normal or trending? I mean, uh, this time, inflation in Poland. The food prices rose 7, 6.7%. 6 the average inflation is roughly about 3% for uh, January. 2020 and the question is um, is it local phenomena or is it global thing and we are just part of the global economy i think we are part of the global slowdown and phenomenon 
So uh, because we are part of this globalizing market and we are part of the European Union. When we have slowdown in Germany, for example, right away we see the um, problem in Poland. But to some extent Poland is immune to problems in the world or in the European Union. Uh, we saw it uh, 10 years ago during the huge crisis some people were comparing to this depression of 1920s when uh, all those countries got sick. But actually we were this, you remember, green island on this uh, rough uh, waters uh, of globalizing markets. Because we have a really big and quite rigid regime of controlling how much we spend how we spend our money. For example, we are uh, not having problem like uh, France, for example, or even the United States, but it's a special case with public debt. It's always below 60%. And it's part of those microeconomic uh, conditions we have to fulfill regarding our uh, presence in the European Union, because we have to, 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 to meet the Maastricht uh, conditions uh, terms uh, we agreed uh, more than 20 years ago. So uh, the inflation is something surprising in January. It was 4.4% of inflation, which is uh, quite surprising. And we have also the rise in the prices of vegetables, for example, or generally food and alcohol. Uh, the price of this rose uh, by 6.7% last year year. We have also a slowdown in how much GDP is growing for the last quarter of 2019. There was a minimal growth in terms of GDP. But remember, we always look on microeconomic data uh, in one year. So we need a span of time to say whether we have something which is mm, really um, dangerous and uh, long term or something which is short term and might be related even to coronavirus problem in China. It also is affecting the price of food, despite the fact that China is far away from European Union and Poland. But at the same time, look, we can expect a lowering pri lower prices of oil, for example, because China will be consuming less oil due to the coronavirus crisis, it means the price of oil will be cheaper at our gas stations in Poland, which immediately will affect the price of food, bread, because bread is being carried, uh, carried around well, it's, it's uh, on the ob Obviously, that uh, every price depends on the oil that oil, is the main, exactly. main economical factor. Um, the question for us is how resilient is Poland in terms of trouble? Ten years ago, our advantage was low labor cost and very huge interconnectivity with Western market. That means that we were able to provide them with the products that were competitive even with Chinese products. Right now, we are moving up the ladder. Our labor price well, is like twice as expensive as it was ten years ago. And can we have a flexibility to face the upcoming crisis. Uh, absolutely. We are to some extent immune to all those uh, problems. Uh, for example, due to the fact that we do not have euro uh, currency yet. So it means that we can depreciate value of our currency, for example. This is what cannot do the Greeks. And they regret now because they simply were forced to accept uh, euro currency and become part of eurozone. And in this case, you cannot manipulate with monetary instruments by depreciating your own currency in order to make your export cheaper. We can still do it because we have not, we are still not part of euro eurozone. Uh, besides that, we are uh, also quite resilient in terms that we are still competitive in terms of uh, cheaper labor than somewhere else. And we have one more advantage. We have 
quite strong internal consumption. Why? Because we have, for example, social programs, social spending like 500 plus, 300, extra money for our pensioners. It's something which is generating internal consumption. And internal consumption is also helping to immune or make our economy more resilient to problems around. Because this is one of the engine of uh, this economy. In growth and growth. Sir, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank Arthur you very Wublewski much. of Lazarski University was our guest and that was it for tonight's Poland Daily Business. Good evening and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. The forecast tomorrow will bring showers to the cities of Koszalin, Gdańsk and Poznań. We can expect partly cloudy skies in the south, east and in Warsaw, and cloudy skies throughout the rest of the country. The temperatures will vary between 5 and 10 degrees. In Europe, we will see sleet in Vilnius, rain in Ankara, Stockholm, Helsinki and Oslo, and scattered showers in Dublin. Overcast skies are expected in London and Berlin, and the rest of the continent can expect clear and partly cloudy skies. The warmest spot on the map will be Lisbon at 20 degrees, while the coldest will be Moscow and Vilnius at 4 degrees. And that is all for now. I thank you for joining us and I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Good day everyone, my name is Maria Kondzielska and you are watching Poland Daily Culture. Could you imagine being 21 years old and publish free books? To run through whole Poland from Zakopane to Gdynia and to sail the Atlantic? Tomasz Sobania is such a person. Tomek, thank you for coming to our program. Thank you for having me. So let's figure out if he sleeps at all or maybe he's some kind of superhero. After your run to Santiago de Compostela, you keep writing, but you also keep running. And you did something very creative, but also you open your heart for a woman who you didn't know before, Dominika Havreluk. And you learned about her story, which is the fact that she lost her breast due to the cancer, but due to also neglectance of doctors. And you decided to run through whole Poland from Zakopane to Gdynia. So for those who don't know, it's from the mountains to the sea, just for her to collect money uh, for her other operations and medical help. Why did you do it? Well, first of all, I have to say that the reason to just to run through the whole Poland was first because I wanted to do this because it was my another challenge and so on. And then uh, came this reason that I can also help somebody uh, through that action. And, and that's, that's how it happened. You know, I was, when I was running to Santiago de Compostela, I was also helping that I was sick also. Her name was, is Laura and she's, she's just 10 years old now. And because of that run, she received 3,000 zloty. So it was maybe not too much, but I helped somebody. And next year, I decided I'm going to do the same. Maybe I will do this on a bigger scale. Maybe I will, I will help someone. And when I found about Dominika and her story, I decided to run for her. So I uh, created a fundraiser on the internet. While I was running, there were people paying, uh, raising money and so on. And that was the way it happened this year, last year. 2019. And tell us full story of Dominika. 
Well, it's quite a sad story, a tough story about the even tougher girl, because she was diagnosed with a cancer, with a breast cancer, but even before that she lost her sister uh, due to cancer also. And she's also a mother, she's a wife, she has three children. And when she got an information about the cancer, it must have been very difficult for her. So that's her story, that's what has happened to her. And the thing with Dominika is that uh, maybe her breast could be um, could be saved, but due to the neglectance of the doctors who postponed the operation, the procedure was much harder and it actually um, needed to be amputated. Tell me, how did you learn about her story? Well, I was told about her when I was talking with the president of a, a local foundation and he told me about her, he told me about her story and I thought, oh my God, what would I do if I would be her on her place, you know, having children and that was very hard and I thought, uh, I can help her, so I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm going to do all I could to help her, that's, that's how it was. And that's how you decided to run from Zakopane to Gdynia. Please tell me how this run looked like. Well, it was fantastic. You may think it's extreme. It was extreme, but it was also fantastic. I started in Zakopane. I was terribly scared. How is it going to be running a marathon every day for two and a half weeks? Uh, it was, again, very hard to imagine how, how am I going to do this. But uh, yet again, I was thinking only about this day that is forward and run every day a marathon. I first get to Krakow, then I get to Kielce, then to Radom and Warsaw, and it was a great time for me when when I get to Warsaw and I thought, oh my God, I did it. I'm having 400 kilometers. And what was the most surprising for me was that my body actually get used to this run, get used to this, these kilometers. And after 10 days, I was waking up and nothing really hurts. And I was running even faster than before. Uh, and that was extraordinary. How much can the human body take? Uh, my body took 18 marathons every day and eventually I ran to Gdynia and we raised 30,000 zloty for Dominica. Once again, how much money did you raise for Dominica? 30,000. So you managed to raise 30,000 zloty yes. for Dominica to help, in order to help with her bath or with the cancer. And you run a marathon for 18 days in a row. Yes. I would be probably dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad, I'm telling you. What was the bigger obstacle? For example, did you have such a moment when you thought, oh, go oh gosh, I'm not going to do it, or oh, I have an injury? Yes, so I how had, did it look like? I had an injury twice. It was very hard to manage this. I was calling my friend who helped me manage this. I was having people on the track who were helping me dealing with the injuries and so on. And there were many moments when I was just alone by myself, running somewhere in the middle of the woods and there was no, nobody there. And I just had to pray not to stop and just keep going uh, just to this kilometer that, that lasts every day. Uh, so it was hard, but there were also many beautiful moments when I was running and, and I loved that moment when I'm uh, far away from everything. And that, there were many moments when I could be just alone and also it's, it was not only scary, there were not only moments when I was alone and I was afraid what was going to happen, but I, there were moments when I was very happy just running through, that, uh, through the whole Poland. And do you know what are the outcomes of Dominika's treatment? Yes, it actually gets better. Um, when I found about her, that was the situation was tougher. The, the, that was quite a tough time. But then uh, the doctors managed to kill the most dangerous um, cells. And right now the cancer doesn't cancer doesn't grow. It was stopped. But right now. Uh, they had to do all the best to just uh, finally eliminate that. So this is a good news, I think. Today we only hear good news. Could you imagine a 21-year-old who for 18 days run every day a marathon? If such things are possible, it brings me back hope and faith in humanity. So it's absolutely wonderful. And thank you for watching Berlin Daily Culture.
Welcome back to Poland Daily History with me, Nicholas Richardson, and in the studio, Professor Krzysztof Jabłonka. And we're going to talk now about another major um, neighbour of, of, of Poland, that is Ukraine. Professor, Ukraine, a huge country now, a, a very important neighbour of, of Poland. There have been, I think, in history, several attempts to create a, a proper Polish-Ukrainian mm -hmm. sort of confederation or union. The first of these, I think, was in 1658. Could you say a few words about what led to this and what the result was? It should be added that Piłsudski, when he was in exile in Siberia, met a local doctor of Ukrainian origin who explained to him the difference between Ukrainians and Russians and thus also Poles. Piłsudski understood the aspirations of Ukraine. He realized that they were at an earlier stage than the Poles. Poles had great intelligence, even magnates. It was a certain degree of independence that the invaders had to reckon with. Only the Austrian monarchy treated Ukraine with respect. Piłsudski was able to impose on Poles a kind of respect for Ukraine, which caused Poland to treat the reborn Ukrainian state after World War I seriously, establishing diplomatic contacts. Unfortunately, in 1918, not one, but two Ukrainian states were reborn, the latter being definitely anti-Polish. Piłsudski did not establish relations with this country. It was a country in the so-called Eastern Galicia, known as Halicina, which decided to attack Poland. We were at war with them until mid-1919. However, with the first country ruled by Simon Betliur, who led Ukraine's struggle for independence, we made two agreements. In April 1920, a military agreement, and later, a political agreement in which both countries considered themselves equal, the heirs of the former republic. According to this agreement, Poland came to Ukraine's aid when Ukraine started a war with the Bolsheviks for its liberation. Unfortunately, it ended in a catastrophe. Simon Budionis' powerful cavalry arrived at the Polish front, could not stand it anymore. In order to save the army and not allow to be surrounded, Polish troops have to withdraw. Eventually, however, Poles and Ukrainians defeated Budionny's army. The example of the defense of the Polish town of Zamość by the Ukrainian general Marko Bedruczko became a legend. This military commander drove Budionny's army away, and then the Poles and Ukrainians, in a powerful and the last in the 20th century horse-drawn charge, defeated the Bolsheviks, and we were given the land we had lost before. Unfortunately, however, the Poles did not have the strength to help the rest of Ukraine, the Kievan Ukraine, to regain independence. We were dependent on the supply of ammunition, and when France cut off our ammunition supply, we were forced to end the war. For this reason, a truce was signed, and then the Treaty of Riga. Could we say some words about the earlier attempt at the Polish-Ukrainian Union in 1658. Previous relations between Poland and Ukraine were quite specific. In the 14th century, Ukraine as a state of Kiev and Ruthenia was broken up by a powerful invasion of the Mongols, from whom it was liberated by the Lithuanian army. A great battle of Kulikovo in 1380 took place, where the Tatars were defeated and the territories occupied by them were liberated by Lithuanians. When they made the deal with Poland, these areas became our common land. This was until the Union of Lublin was renewed. The Lithuanians broke off contacts with the King of Poland, insulted him, and the King, by his power and decision, transferred the Ukrainian territories to the Polish rule. He thus led to the unification of Poland with Ukraine. At that time, a very clear agreement was made. Lithuania and Belarus created the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and Poland, with Ukraine, created the Crown. The Crown of the Kingdom of Poland was formed, and representatives of Ukraine entered the common same of the Republic. Magnates living on these lands very quickly became Polish magnates. Almost all magnates are former Ruthenians. 
The situation of the peasants was completely the opposite. Polish peasants fled to Ukraine because they could be free there. In this way, a conflict arose between the magnates, so the nobility, and the Cossacks. However, it is worth noting that Poles and Ukrainians were members of both groups, so it was not a national conflict, but a social one. Eventually, the Cossacks got ennobled, but only partially, and it was still too late. The Treaty of Haldia was concluded in 1658, which established a separate, third state of the Republic of Poland, the Grand Duchy of Ruthenia. The opponents of this movement were both the magnates of the Republic, most of whom were Ruthenians themselves, and the Duchy of Moscow. This led to the eventual liquidation of this state, separated on the Dnieper River. The lands to the east of the Dnieper River went to the Duchy of Moscow, which finally destroyed the Cossack autonomy, and the land located to the west of the Dnieper River remained with the Republic. It is worth mentioning that today in Ukraine only the part that survived under the Republic of Poland speaks Ukrainian. The part that got into the hands of the Grand Duchy of Moscow and later the Tsarist Russia speaks mostly Russian nowadays. Ta, która dostała się księstwu moskiewskiemu, a potem caratowi e, em, rosyjskiemu, w zasadzie mówi po rosyjsku. Well, Professor, that's been fascinating. Thank you very much for coming to the studio. Thank you for watching Poland Daily History. Join us again when we look at more exciting episodes from the history of Poland. Welcome to Poland Daily. In the next few episodes, we are going to take you around Kielce in the Holy Cross Mountains. We're going to talk to a statue of Jan Karski, see what it has to say. We are going to see the Bishop's Palace and all its splendor. And we'll look at a Stone Age quarry on the edge of town where a Cro-Magnon man lived once upon a time and where we live now. After that, we'll stay the night in a beautiful fortress. Yes, we're going medieval, not only with the fortress, but also with two castles, Mirov and Bobolice. These are twin castles over on the edge of Silesia. That is where Sviantorszewska gives way to Silesia. Mirov is being renovated, and Bobolice is the splendid finished product. So, lots of excellent stuff ahead. Stay with us for more of Poland Daily Travel. Why do we do it? We do it for you. Like us on Facebook, Poland Daily Travel, and like us on YouTube at Poland Daily Live. Thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Poland Daily Travel. We're here in the snow, walking between two chateaus. That's right. The Mirov Castle and the Bobulica Castle, which are here in Silesia, on the edge of Silesia and Świętorzyska. That is the Holy Cross Mountains. Listen, I have a story to tell you, a legend that kind of ties things together about this particular uh, piece of territory. So the legend is about two twin brothers, one who lived in the Mirov castle and the other one who lived in Bobolica. That's right. And this was in the dark and snowy medieval times. Apparently, they were so close and enjoyed each other's company so much and counsel. They discussed everything, all the issues that you could possibly have to discuss family, business, etc., that they built a tunnel between that castle and the one over there. And everything was fine. One of the brothers uh, put, until one of the brothers uh, uh, brought back a woman from one of his adventures abroad. This was the time, you know, of the later, um, the very later uh, uh, wars, or sorry, they must have been the early wars of 
Poland against uh, when, the, when the country was really being created into a larger kingdom. It was uh, Kazimierz the Great time. And there were battles all over the place. Okay, north, south, east and west. Well, it seems there was some treasure that was put down there. And there was a witch who guarded that treasure. Well, um, when the girl was brought back, they had never fought before, these two brothers. They hadn't fought about the treasure. And the witch kept things uh, under control so nobody could steal it. But uh, when they brought this, uh, this lady back, that, oh boy, that caused a big problem. Because both brothers fell in love with her. And in fact, she ran away with the treasure. The witch was on holiday, apparently. She had gone to a witch's Sabbath on Bald Mountain in the Holy Cross Mountains. Uh, Wisse Gora, which we went to in one of our uh, earlier shows. So she had gone to this to perform some pagan rituals, as witches will do, at least the ones I know. Maybe the witches you know behave in a different fashion. I keep them at arm's length anyway. So this poor girl was caught, you know, trying to escape with the treasure, brought back, and the one brother walled her up in the Bobolitsa castle. And to this day, they call her the Lady in White, and she wanders about, and people see her of a dark and stormy night. So they say, it was a dark and stormy night, no doubt. At any rate, that's the story of Mirov, Bobolitsa, and the two brothers, told to you on a very spooky late afternoon in January. I don't know about you, but it makes me shiver, or it could just be the wind. See you later. We're going to go see the castle now. Okay, everybody, look, what did I promise you? The finished product. That's what the other castle, Miroth, will eventually look like. In fact, it's the same family. I, uh, I believe that's doing the Miroth castle now, because I just spoke to a fella who told me that he's from the family. So we can be sure that they're going to do an excellent job. The Bobolitsa castle here, was uh, built in the mid uh, 1300s. And the story's kind of interesting because it was uh, staffed by Czechs and other Germans and other foreigners. Uh, and they were making uh, deals with the Teutonic Knights from up in the northern part of Poland. And uh, this was not sitting well with Kazimierz the Great. So uh, as things evolved, eventually his heir, uh, the uh, King Jagalonia, for whom the university in Krakow uh, is named, uh, he threw them out and installed some of his people right at the end of the uh, 1300s. So the result is this beautiful Gothic castle. It looks like something right out of Disney, doesn't it? <coughs> if you were going to picture in your mind a medieval castle, you might very well see this one. And you can also see here how they've used, built it right into the limestone, like as they did with Mirov. Isn't that 
unique and interesting. They build the castle right into the limestone. It saves a lot of uh, other work. So that's it. You've heard the legend. You've seen the Miroff Castle. You know about the Trail of the Eagle, Eagle's Nest, the most popular trail in Poland, starting in either Czestochowa or in Krakow and coming right through this area on the edge of Silesia and the edge of Małopolska. Well, I think it's worth doing. It's a great area of Poland. And you will love it if you come and see it. The food is great. The people are especially hospitable. Well, in Poland they are throughout the country, but uh, especially hospital, hospitable in this, uh, in this part and in uh, the Holy Cross Mountains where we were before. So I recommend it highly. It's not my first rodeo, as they say. Been to a lot of countries, but this is a fine spot. So Poland Daily. Why do we do it? Oh, we do it for you. Keep watching. See you next time.